live streaming has started. <clears throat> So is this open to the public or not? Well, it will be open to only people who have the link. Yeah, registered. Yeah. Okay. Only who have the link. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But we have but shared the YouTube link on uh, social media. Oh, so you have. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube. If anybody can watch on YouTube. Yeah. 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 Oh. And where is the YouTube link? Because Geeta wanted to watch. I can give it to her. Where is the YouTube link? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I Can you put it in the chat uh, box? Yeah, we'll put it in the chat box. I think it's also on the website uh, resonance uh, page. Gita? Uh, this uh, huh, yeah. Inkatesh has. The Inkatesh has. <laughs> As usual, come forward to. <laughs> Good morning, Suri. Good morning. How are you? Nice to see you. Yes, just yeah. looking forward to your talk as usual. <laughs> <laughs> sort of excitement. <laughs> Thank you. Should we start, uh, Jasjeet? Yeah, so Joy? Yeah, I think we can maybe just wait a minute. Uh, Manik is going to coordinate today. So, okay. yeah, yeah, Manik uh, yeah. can invite, uh, start our talk in a minute yeah. and invite Vidya. Yeah. So, good morning, everybody. So, today is our second day. This first half, uh, Professor Vidya is the chairperson. So I'll request her to continue this session, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the second day of the Resonance Lecture Series Undergraduate Students Program, uh, celebrating 25 years of resonance. It's a great pleasure to welcome our first speaker today, Professor Raghavendra Gadakka. Professor Gadakka is the Department of Science and Technology Year of Science Chair Professor at the Center for Ecological Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru. He did his BSc honors and MSc in zoology from Bangalore and PhD in molecular biology from the Indian Institute of Science, but shifted fields to work on his other passion, animal behavior, so that he could carry out world-class research in India, unfettered by constraints of funds or equipment. He and his lab group have done fascinating work on the social evolution, social organization and behavior of the locally available paper wasp, Propylidia marginata, as well as on other wasps, ants, and bees. He has been recognized by various awards in India and abroad, such as the Bhatnagar Prize and the Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. And uh, there are too many to list here. But more importantly, he is an excellent teacher who exhorts students and others to read widely and think critically and carefully 
and also across different subject boundaries. He's also an excellent communicator who has introduced animal behavior and science in general to various audiences. His most recent book, Experiments in Animal Behavior, Cutting Edge Research at Trifling Cost, demonstrates how cutting edge research can be carried out using elegantly designed experiments and careful behavioral observations, which do not necessarily require expensive or sophisticated equipment. And he will be uh, talking about some of those experiments today. This book is available free of cost and can be downloaded from the Indian Academy of Science website. And I will share the link in the chat box shortly. He has also been writing very interesting articles about various topics in a series titled More Fun Than Fun in The Wire. And I urge you to read those also. I will also share that link. Uh, today, Professor Gadakkar will speak about animal behavior, experiments for everyone. Uh, he will be describing a series of experiments so we can have the question and answer session after each experiment. So you can ask your questions at, at the end of each experiment. You are also welcome to keep your videos on, but please uh, mute yourselves while he's speaking. Thank you, uh, sir. Shall I start? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Vidya. Thank you for the organizers. Uh, uh, normally, I say it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you, but today I must say something more. Resonance is, is at the middle of my heart. So I have been involved in resonance from the very beginning, and it has been a wonderful experiment. We started in a small way, but other people like Vidya and uh, Suri and so on have really taken it uh, forward. It's become really a medium of communication uh, in the country, both for uh, undergraduate students, teachers, also for practicing scientists. So I'm very happy that uh, we are celebrating the Silver Jubilee and that I have an opportunity to talk, to talk to you. The talk will actually be based on articles I published in Resonance and which have now been compiled in a book, as Vidya said. I will now share my screen. Uh, can you see my title slide? Yeah. Okay. So I have called this animal behavior experiments for everyone. And the focus is really, on, for, my major focus is on everyone. Next focus is on experiments and third focus is on animal behavior. So that's my hierarchy. Everyone is most, is most important. And I know that the audience consists of students from various disciplines. Uh, in fact, these discipline boundaries are not important. Yeah, I'm just taking animal behavior because I know something about it. I don't want to talk about areas that I don't know, but the audience certainly knows much more than me in their areas, and they should translate this to their areas. So, but let me begin very generally. What is science? Science is not just a body of facts discovered by others. Unfortunately, this is the answer, honest answer you will get if you ask a student of science in India. What is science? It's a body of facts discovered by others. That is the underlying definition. But this is not true and this is very unfortunate. Science is an activity that all of us can and should undertake and enjoy. Science should be a curiosity-driven, playful exploration of the natural world. Unfortunately, modern science has become an expensive, almost industrial activity, heavily dependent on sophisticated laboratories and expensive equipment. Now, I say unfortunately because this has some very serious negative consequences. At the local level, there are serious consequences. So I've listed these under local consequences. This has had the effect of making most people and especially young students feel that doing science is beyond their reach. And all they can do is to learn what other better endowed people have already done. This is the most serious problem facing science education in India. The most serious problems facing science education in India are not lack of teachers, lack of funds, lack of books, lack of laboratories. It is the impression that Science is meant to be learned, mugged up, and absorbed. We are supposed to consume knowledge, not produce knowledge. This is the most serious problem. And this is the thing we have to change. Ironically, this is the easiest thing to change. 
because it doesn't require government support it doesn't require money you don't have to write grant proposal you don't have to face rejection letters you just have to transmit this information and people should believe that i can do science not just study science or learn science there are also global consequences and it's important for us to be aware of this especially for the senior people who are in managerial affairs it's important for us to be aware that there are serious global consequences of this view of science at a global level this tends to make developing countries mere consumers rather than producers of knowledge and yet many major new discoveries in science still come and will forever come from inexpensive and playful exploration uh, i'm not the only one saying this there are many people say this and i have a i would like to today to quote from a friend of mine who has said this very nicely in a particular context in a book that will be published next month this book is called mind of the bee and this is professor lars chitka from queen mary university london this is the book is being published by princeton university press will be available next month and he has uh, said very nicely in his book many of today's academics and many journal editors and funding agencies confuse using fancy and often expensive technology for entirely predictable outcomes they confuse this with the process of scientific discovery they are not the same to this date many of the most important discoveries in biology are made with careful observation and the simplest experimental tools imagined while armies of scientists equipped with fashionable omics tools confirm decades old knowledge with novel methods with marginal gains in terms of pushing the boundaries of science for those of you who may not be familiar omics tools are the most sophisticated modern tools in molecular biology you can start with genomics and then you have proteomics and transcriptomics and metabolomics and you can have many many omics they are always very expensive they are good so those who have money should do them but an uh, undergraduate student in uh, iser mohali or iser trivandrum or indian science or st joseph college or in any small college should not feel because i can't afford omics tools i can't do science this is all i want to dispel There's nothing wrong with omics those who have omics tools please use them but there are many who cannot afford omics tools and they should not feel that i can only be a consumer of knowledge i cannot be a producer because i don't have omics tools or whatever is the equivalent in your in your field science and technology we must make this distinction we should not confuse science with technology a high school student or a retired school teacher may or may not be able to contribute to the development of technology i'm saying may or may not sometimes they may be but every one of them may not be able to contribute to the development of technology some can but the point is that they everyone can contribute to the development of new knowledge there there is no problem everybody can contribute i like to show this cartoon uh, i like to look at this cartoon uh, and i think everybody should look at this cartoon and remind themselves of what the real distinction is between big science and little science this is a cartoon by the famous american cartoonist sydney harris who spent his whole life drawing cartoons making fun of scientists basically and he is like he's wonderful so here he has two panels there is einstein sitting in a, with a piece of paper and pencil on the left side nothing else uh, and that's called big science and on the right side you have this huge sophisticated technological laboratory and uh, sydney harris labels this as little science and i agree with him so we must know the distinction between what is big science so it is the ideas that matter not the technology not the method that you use that matter but what is the idea that is, that really is what so big science is in terms of ideas as i said since my specialty is animal behavior i will take examples from animal behavior and as vidya said i will show you how any one of us can do simple experiments using my own field of natural history and animal behavior i will illustrate how interesting experiments can be performed by almost anyone who is curious and committed and without necessarily having access to a sophisticated laboratory i keep emphasizing without necessarily having if you have there is no problem at all i am not saying you are not a good scientist or you cannot do good science even if you don't have you can do that's the point i want to emphasize because often people say oh you know even in so sophisticated equipment i can do good science of course you can do good science that is not a surprise the surprise is that even without sophisticated laboratory you can do good science 
So I will take examples from ants, bees, and wasps, which are my favorite creatures. Uh, this will be drawn from this book, which Vidya mentioned. This is called Experiments in Animal Behavior, Cutting Edge Research at Trifling Cost. This book contains 16 of my articles, which were originally published in Resonance. They've all been put together. Uh, this uh, book will have examples not only from uh, ants, bees, wasps, but also from fish and birds and snakes and dogs and everybody else, uh, many others, as you can see from the pictures here. Uh, for the interest of time, I will try to cover five or six experiments today. In fact, I have prepared uh, slides to cover the first six chapters of this book. If time permits, I will cover all six of them or at least four or five of them. And these will be about ants, bees and wasps. So let's begin with animal behavior. So let's begin with an ordinary dictionary definition. Scientists should not think that science is something very special. Science grows out of common sense about the knowledge of common man. So we must always begin. So go to the Merriam-Webster dictionary and find out what is ethology. Ethology here in this dictionary is defined as the scientific and objective study of animal behavior, usually with a focus on behavior under natural conditions. So we begin with a very simple layman's definition. And now I want to take you to a definition of a Nobel laureate, not an animal behavior person. A Nobel laureate in immunology, Sir Peter Medawar. It's in, insufficient if you say Peter Medawar is a Nobel laureate in immunology because he was a Nobel laureate in everything. He was a great intellectual, great writer, understood philosophy, science, many different fields. And this is, he wrote many books, but my most favorite book of Peter Medawar is the one he wrote along with his wife, Jean Medawar. And this book, to start with, has a charming title. It's called Aristotle to Zeus, a Philosophical Dictionary of Biology. So in this book, they have taken various entries that as you would in an encyclopedia and discuss them in a philosophical way. And you can find in all kinds of entries. So when I first came across the book, of course, I looked for E ethology. Does he have an entry in ethology? Yes, they do. The word ethology is not merely an alternate designation for the science of behavior. It is a term that stands for a genuine revolution in biological thought. Ethology is rooted in observation of animal behavior. And I love this. An activity that only simpletons think simple. They go on. Observation is a difficult and sophisticated process, calling upon all the intellectual virtues, attention, patience, heightened awareness, caution in coming to conclusions, courage in framing expectations. These are just two sentences from a two, three page entry, which I urge you to read. Uh, these books are usually available now in most places. Ethology actually began, the modern scenario began with none other than Charles Darwin. Some of you may not know that in addition to his books on evolution and plants and earthworms and beetles and so on, Darwin wrote a fat book called The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And this is really the birth of modern ethology. It's a book which is eminently worth reading. It's a fat book. You, can't, you may not want to read from cover to cover. My recommendation is close your eyes, open any page, start, go to the beginning of any section and read that section. It's delightful to read. Ethology came of age in 1973 when the committee which was responsible for deciding who should get that year's Nobel Prize in what is called physiology or medicine had the courage to say that this year we will give it to people who study animal behavior. Carl von Frisch, Conrad Lorenz, Nicotine Burton. So only time the committee has had the courage but they gave it to ethologists in 1973. Ethology is based on observation and experiment as we saw. And it claims to reveal the minds of animals. So this is a tall order. We should not take it lightly. We must take it very seriously and ask, really, can we understand the mind of an insect? Let's find out. Let's not answer yes or no beforehand. In fact, each of you should find out. Each of you should harbor the skepticism. No, it's not possible. We cannot understand the mind of the animal and go and try and see if you succeed. Someday in your life, you might decide, yes, actually true. All these years I thought not possible, but decide for yourself. 
So this is where I will start with the first experiment. And I will start with an experiment by one of these three Nobel laureates, Nicotine Bergen, a Dutch scientist, uh, spent most of his working career at Oxford University in, in the UK and did many things, studied many animals, birds, insects, uh, mammals, all kinds of animals he studied. And he was one of the fathers of mythology. Now I will describe one, the simplest experiment. He was fond of going out, outdoors and observing. And among many things he observed, he observed this wasp. This is a solitary wasp. It's not a social wasp like the ones I study. And if time permits, I will talk to you about one such experiment on social wasp. This is a solitary wasp. What does this wasp do? The wasp mate, of course, and the male dies. The female, after having gathered sperm from the male, will want to reproduce. And she will dig a small hole under the ground, make a little underground nest, and she will then provision that nest with food for her future larvae. And the food consists of bees. So it's a nice competition between wasps and bees. So she will go and hunt bees and she will sting them, but she will not kill them. She will paralyze them with a neurotoxin so that the bee is alive but cannot move about. And she will bring these paralyzed bees and stuff them, several of them, into this nest which she has. Then she will lay an egg on that and she will close it and she will go away, never come back again. Her eggs will hatch into little larvae and they have ready-made fresh honeybee food available to them. The honeybee hasn't moved away because it has been paralyzed. They will eat the bee, they will grow and they will pupate inside the same nest and out of that nest will come out adult wasps and the cycle will continue. Now, this scientifically, this wasp is called Philanthus triangulum. Commonly, it is called bee wolf because it hunts wolves. It hunts bees. It's a wolf that hunts bees. And what Tinbergen, curiosity, that's what he, he saw many such wasps having many of their individual nests. And he asked, how does a wasp know which is my nest and which is somebody else's nest? I shouldn't go and uh, deposit food in somebody else's nest. I should do it in my nest, right? So how do the bees recognize this? And he, there are so many nests and for him, they all look identical. And the bee has to go, the wasp has to go off hunt bees, maybe after half an hour, one hour, come back, and it has to find its particular role. How does it do that? So he hypothesized. He said, probably it uses visual cues. It probably learns what the surrounding landmarks around its nest look like, remembers that, and comes back and finds it. Or maybe it uses olfactory cues, chemical cues. It knows what it that particular part of the soil smells like. And it designed extremely simple experiment to distinguish between these hypotheses. He said, first, let me test the visual hypothesis. So what is the hypothesis? They learn the details of the landmark. Now he did not apply for a big grant and said, I want a sophisticated camera and a pattern recognition software. So I'm going to describe the pattern of soil around this and use this in my experiment. No, he said, very simple. The landmarks seem to be very subtle, too subtle for me. Let me exaggerate, because if the wasp can recognize subtle landmark, I'm sure it can recognize exaggerated landmark. So he looked around and he found a lot of dead pine cones around. He picked them up and he placed them in a circle around the nest, as you see in the top figure. He placed several pine cones around the nest. And he says, now this is an exaggerated landmark, which even a stupid person like me can recognize. The wasp should surely be able to recognize if that is what it is interested in recognizing. So he place them and he allowed the wasp to go back and forth several times and now he says now the wasp must have learned that now its nest is surrounded by pine cones. So when the wasp was away, he mischievously, this kind of experience requires a little bit of mischief and that's why I think it's best done by young kids, but he never grew up. He was a young kid throughout his life. He removed the pine cones and placed them nearby in what is called a sham nest. There is no real nest here, but just the pine cones and here there are no more pine cones. And his argument was when the wasp comes back, will it go to its original nest or will it get fooled and go to the sham nest, which now has pine cones but no nest? And if it goes to the sham nest, that means it is using visual cues. If not, then it is not using visual cues, probably olfactory cues. So he tested this several times. Very simple. 
He waited for the wasp to come back and demonstrate to him which one she is interested in. She would almost enter this or that, and he did something very clever. He said, I want large sample sizes. I want to do many experiments. So he did not allow the wasp to land. After the wasp revealed her choice, he shooed it away. So after some time, the wasp came back and tried again, and he shooed it again. So he could count how many times the wasp is telling me that I want this one and not that one. And believe it or not, his results are so clear cut that they needed no statistics. He did 17 experiments. In every single time, the wasp chose the sham nest many, many times. Nine times, six times, seven times, five times. Zero, you can see entirely zero in the nest. They always preferred the sham nest. He was not satisfied. He said, maybe the new nest which I have created, the sham nest, maybe there is something nice about it. Maybe it smells very good to the wasp. And that is why it goes there. So I need a control experiment. He said, now I should be able to take all the cones back from the sham nest, put it on the real nest. And now the wasp should choose the real nest. Not that it has some fondness for the new nest. And he did that, sure enough, every single time the wasp went to the old nest, the real nest, and did not go to the sham nest. Can you think of anything more clear cut? Can you think of any conclusion which is more clear? But Tin Burgin was not satisfied. He said, this is fine, but suppose they are using smell in some way. I have to rule out the possibility that they are using smell. I have shown positive evidence that they are using landmarks, using vision. But I have to show that they are not using smell. And again, a very simple experiment. In addition to the pine cones, he took two pieces of cardboard and dipped them in some strong smelling scent vanilla scent or something, and he placed them here. So now you have both visual landmarks and smell, and the wasp learns both if it can, if it wants, learns both. Now, what did he do in the experiment? He moved all the pine cones from the real nest to the sham nest, but left the scented cardboard pieces with the original nest. Now you see there's a competition between smell and vision. The old nest has the smell, the new nest has the vision, has the landmarks. But he did some small, these small things are very important. He said, the old nest has this cardboard. Maybe it likes those cardboards, not the smell. So he placed two cardboards with the new nest along with the pine cones without the scent. So visually, now the new nest resembles the old nest completely, pine cone and cardboard. The old nest only has the scented cardboards. Now competition. Smell versus vision. Where do the wasps go? Again, clear cut experiments. Every time they went to the sham nest, which had unscented cardboard. The original nest had scented cardboard. They didn't care about the scent. They were worried about the vision. Again, he reversed. Now, when he reversed, he put the pine cones back here and with the scented. And now every time the wasp used the nest itself. Clearly, vision is winning over all action. But he was not satisfied. This is the point. You should never be satisfied. Even if after getting the Nobel Prize, you must go and see, can I find fault with my experiment? The Nobel Committee has given me the prize. They are maybe stupid, but there may be something wrong. I must try. So keep on trying to disprove yourself, disprove your conclusions, disprove your experiments. We don't give prizes in science for being correct. What you do is important. What you find is not important. If you can find fault with the a Nobel laureate science, you should get two Nobel Prizes, right? I always tell my young students, there are two pathways to doing good science, great science. One is you take a fashionable area and knock it down, show that people have been wrong. Or you take a totally unknown area and make it fashionable. Take an unfashionable area and make it fashionable or take a fashionable area and destroy it. These are, these are two ways of doing science. So Tinbarjan was not satisfied. He said, I have to rule out all action. This is not enough. This is just a competition. Maybe between the two, they like this more, but maybe they can also smell. So again, he did extremely simple experiment. He said, who knows, the pine cones may have a smell. And it is the smell that they are really looking, not they are not looking at the shape of the pine cones. It is the smell of pine cones they are learning. So it could well be all faction. They don't like my vanilla scented cardboard. They like the pine cones. So very simple. He took the pine cones home and Soak them in alcohol overnight. 
Next morning, they were devoid of smell. They repeated the experiment. And he found when cones were soaked in alcohol, they worked just as well. That means the smell was not important. Was, then he was not satisfied. He said, I may have removed the smell from the, what about the wasp? Let me cut off the antenna of the wasp so that they cannot smell, even if there is smell. And wasp with amputated antennae also learned visual mark and marks. Wasp could not be trained on scent alone. And he showed that the visual landmarks were recognized from up to 100 to 200 meters away. That far away they couldn't. The point is never be satisfied. In fact, I give an assignment to my students saying, now please find out a flaw in this and do, don't even do, you design, you suggest another experiment which will further reinforce or knock down this conclusion. Science is endless. It depends how you have to think. And the more experiments that have been done, you have the harder you have to think. But see if you can think of another experiment which you can do, which may call these in doubt. Don't worry that the Nobel Prize Committee will take away the Nobel Prize. He's dead anyway, but try and knock down this experiment. So, simple, curiosity driven, never satisfied, impeccable logic, and it's a continuous process. That's what I want to illustrate with this experiment. And now we can take a break and take a few questions before I go to experiment two. If there are any questions. Are there any questions? Uh, so far on, nobody has typed out any question, but you can, those of you who are on Zoom can anybody ask like your question. Ask any question? Is anybody there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Venkatesh, what about you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Venkatesh is not asking. <laughs> oh, so I'm writing, I'm writing. Okay, you can oh, write. No, you can ask directly. Uh, if you are on Zoom, you can ask directly. Sure. Sir, so, like, how are we so sure that the scent means the cones that had the alcohol scent, uh -huh. they didn't trigger the olfactory receptors? Like, even alcohol scent is a scent. It may we are not be... sure. No, we are not sure. That's why he cut off the antenna. That's why he did the next experiment. Okay, sir. Each one is a step towards the final goal. See, he was, if you are satisfied, he wouldn't have done the experiment where he amputated the antenna. He said, who knows, in spite of my alcohol, maybe there is some smell. So what is the next experiment? The next cleansing experiment was, take away the antenna of the wall so they cannot smell, even if there is smell. So he's like, not sure. We are not sure. We should not be sure. Now, you, you can ask, I would, I would love to have a student come and tell me, sir, how do you know that the wasp does not smell with its legs? You only removed antenna. Maybe it smells with its legs. This is not crazy. Many flies have receptors on their feet. Flies, when they walk around, they know where food is by having receptors on the bottoms of their feet. So this is not so far fetched. That's the kind of a question I like my throat to ask. Maybe they smell with their legs. Then I would say, yes, amputate the legs and see what happens. So this is endless. We should never be satisfied. No hypothesis can be proved. We can keep on disproving a few things. Nothing is proved. So yes, we are not sure. He was not sure. That's why he did the next experiment. Uh, so then why didn't he started from amputated antennae and blinded eyes and why did he so much like did this much this much pine cones stuff like you start pine? with the simplest you must start with the what is simple and what is more likely to be correct or at least what you think is more likely to be correct and then you go to more and more complicated things for example i could argue that if i didn't need to amputate the antennae why should i amputate the antennae so i will first do and also you can see that his sample sizes kept on decreasing Initially, and see with pine cones, there is no problem. You can get as many dead pine cones as possible. Do as you just you have to spend a lot of time. So you start with the easy and the more obvious and graduate towards the more improbable, more un unlikely, more difficult, more expensive. That's how you progress. You start with very simple things. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Sure. Uh, Akash, can you ask your question? Uh, you have a question about using a microscope. Uh, so I mean, uh, is that uh, at that time, if you use a microscope and dissect that, uh, uh, that what the, sorry? Yes. 
uh, that dissect it and uh, we can all uh, we can see by microscope that uh, it has a uh, uh, some olfactory mechanism or it uh, visually scans the things is that is yeah. Could that could be direct that, method. Could you do that before these experiments or after these experiments? Sir, we can do before this experiment. Wow. Why? Why before these experiments? If you can do it without a microscope, why use a microscope? In fact, many people have used microscope afterwards. They have confirmed the result, but they didn't get the Nobel Prize. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So basically, no, we have to do something. Okay. Don't say okay. Think about it. You must start with the simplest things, which requires nothing. So basically, and, and, we have to start with preliminary um, uh, things and then we can forward to some advanced. Yeah, not can, should, shouldn't it? Why should it? If I don't need a microscope, why should I buy a microscope? If I can yes. do something without a microscope, why should I use a microscope? So, see, see again, remember, we now you will, will immediately say only those who have a microscope can do the experiment. This experiment, anybody can do. My five year old nephew can do this experiment. He doesn't need a microscope. That is the beauty. Later on, I'll, in my next present, I'll tell you how other people with more sophisticated experiments have reconfirmed. I don't want to, because I, I want to take you to another experiment. So shall we move to the next experiment? If there are any more, uh, no more questions? Yeah. I had a question, sir. Yes, please. Uh, why did we just restrict ourselves to two senses only, like visual and olfactory? You, you have no reason to restrict. Please look at all the six senses. Go ahead. I'm giving you one example. This is, this is the problem is we think that science has already been done and all we have to do is to study it. This is not over. This is ongoing. You do the next one. Think of science as an activity in which all of us should participate. If somebody throws one stone, you throw two. If somebody throws a stone to the left side, you throw it to the right. It's not over. It's not finished. This is how it starts. You, you look at all other possible senses. What sense? would you look like? What, which sensory system would you like to look at next? And how would you do it? Think about it. That's what you should. That's how it begins. If you did not say, I have finished, nobody needs to do anything. This is final and I am giving you my sermon and you just listen and go home. You do. No problem. Mm, so we discover a new sensory system in the world. Uh, so, like first in the cardboard thing, he used vanilla scent, and for the pine cones, he used alcohol. Alcohol so, is what, to remove the scent. Uh, yes, I mean, but still, alcohol has some scent. Like alcohol Does has. It? Its own. Does, it? Does it? If you take something, soak it in alcohol, and dry it, even the alcohol would disappear. If you dry it, every molecule of alcohol would disappear. But remember, that is why he was not satisfied with that. That is why he did the amputation experiment. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. You should never be satisfied. You, you, you should not just say, oh, this experiment is wrong because alcohol may have some smell. You must do the next experiment. And you can see each of his experiments supported the conclusion of the previous experiment. But it made that conclusion more and more powerful. The important point is it's not over. You see, this, we should, science, what was my first sentence in my first slide, science is not a body of facts discovered by others. It is an activity. It's an activity that should continue. That you should participate in. And why am I taking the simplest possible example? Because everybody can do. Otherwise, there are hundreds of people saying, Sir, I don't have a microscope. We are very easy to give excuses. So I'm giving examples where nobody has an excuse. That's why I'm starting with the simplest thing. Remember my title Experiments for Everyone, not only those lucky ones who have a microscope. Okay? Uh, I so, think there's one more. Question, okay. Uh, Bhuvana Ali, do you have a question? Okay, I think. Okay. Yeah, it has been my experience that it is very difficult to wean people away from technology once they have it. But you must imagine yeah. people who don't have it. We want to make, my goal is to make science inclusive, science democratic. Everybody. See, if I do a brilliant experiment and care, but nobody else could have done it because only I have that experiment. There's no reason for me to feel so proud. If you had that experiment, you would also have done it. If I do an experiment which you could have done but did not do, that's when I pat myself on the back. If I get a huge grant, one million grant, I buy the most expensive equipment and I tell all my colleagues in my department, you guys are useless, you're stupid. See, I am doing the experiment, I am publishing in nature. That is nothing great. I must do something which anybody could have done but did not do. It is I who did it. That is. 
So let me move on to second experiment. This, as you can guess, is from another Nobel laureate, Karl von Frisch. Karl von Frisch was a German zoologist. He's very famous because he discovered the honeybee dance language. He was very fond of honeybees. He did most of his work on honeybees. As you know, honeybees live in these very large colonies. And in each colony, you have a queen, you have some uh, drones, and a very large number of workers. Honeybees go outside, collect nectar and pollen, and bring back to life. Now, when they come back to home, they are able to perform a dance. And through that dance, they communicate information to the bees at home. What have they found? How far is it from the nest? And in what direction to go? This is what he discovered, and he got the Nobel Prize. But I don't even want to start. I want to start with much earlier. When he was much younger, a very simple experiment he did, starting with curiosity. Just like Tinbergen asked, how does the wasp know this is my nest? He said, why are flowers brightly colored? You see, flowers are all brightly colored. Why? This is what we must understand. Everything should have an explanation. That is what science is about. Why do I have five fingers? Good question. Ask. Try to answer it. Why not six? Why not four? Why should I have five fingers on both sides? Why not five on one, six on the other normally? Everything is a question that deserves to be asked. So, Fonfrey said, all these flowers are so beautiful. Why? Why should they be so beautiful? And he says, there's one possible answer, but these answers are always hypotheses, waiting to be tested. He said, it must be to attract bees. Because as you know, most flowers depend on insects such as bees to cross-pollinate. So it must, the function of these bright colors must be to attract bees. That's how they make the bees come to them. But there's a problem in this hypothesis, because if this hypothesis even is, deserves to be tested, deserves to be entertained, bees must have color vision. In those days, this is the early 20th century, 1930s and so on, people believed that color vision is very rare and insects certainly cannot have color vision and even mammals, not all of them have color vision. So there is a very erratic distribution of color vision in the animal kingdom and forget it, bees are not possible. This is not just common wisdom. Very interestingly, it turns out that the greatest vision scientist of his day, a man called C. von Hess. He was considered the greatest authority on vision science in his day. He was knighted. He was a very famous scientist, very senior scientist. And he had written, he had concluded that bees do not have color vision. In fact, it turns out that on the basis of some very sloppy experiments under completely unnatural conditions, he had concluded that all invertebrates and even fish were color blind. I don't blame him for doing that. I blame for people accepting that. Don't accept anything anybody says, even if it is Nobel laureate. Von Frisch was not impressed. And he said, I will do my own experiments. I am not convinced by this guy. I will do my own experiments. And Von Frisch did his own experiments, which I will talk about. But let me tell you, because I may forget to tell you later on, even after Karl von did his experiment, this guy didn't relate. He wrote a paper saying that Von Frisch is completely wrong and it is impossible that bees have color vision. Nevertheless, it is Von Frisch who got the Nobel Prize and not Von Hess because he questioned. There's a very poignant story. Von Frisch was a very young kid at that time. And he, this great authoritative man, uh, dismissed uh, uh, Von Frisch saying it is completely wrong. The Von Frisch historians have shown that wrote a letter to his mother saying, Dear mom, for the first time I begin to feel that I have an enemy in this world and he may damage my career. But he didn't succeed. Von Frisch decided to do his own experiment. This is a picture of a much older Von Frisch. When he did this experiment, he was a young man. He basically trained. There's a charming train that goes by my, my window. I'll pause for a minute when it goes by. And then, okay. So he trained bees to come and shake sugar solution from color, based on a colored cardboard. And he said, I will now ask whether bees can learn this color. If they can, then they should have. Now these experiments again were so simple that in fact, I have routinely have 10 standard students from the Kendri Vidyalaya attached to my institute to come and repeat these experiments in my lab as part of their science project to arouse their curiosity. And my high school kids have constructed a little cardboard box 
and there is a green window and a blue window and there is food sugar solution inside and they train the bees to come and collect sugar from inside what they do is they very cleverly keep one of these closed and keep only one open so the bee for example may learn that no point in going to the green door it's closed i must go to the blue door and they remember blue and the argument is that if bees can remember blue and they will go to the blue then they must have coloration so the experiments are very simple you train the bees and then in the test what you do is you clean up this put fresh uh, unsmelling uh, cardboard boxes and ask where will the bees go if the bees have been trained to go to blue then in the experiment 104 out of 106 went to the blue only two went to the green but is it blue and green they distinguished or did they distinguish left versus right so the students do another experiment where they put blue cardboard on both sides and now 96 go to the left side and 97 go to blue right side so it is not left versus right they have learned but it is blue versus green they have learned but maybe they like blue they don't like green so another experiment train them to green and now 100 out of 103 go to green only 3 go to blue again green on both sides they don't care about left versus right they always they go to both sides on fresh was not satisfied he said this does not prove that they have color vision because all of us know that we can distinguish different shades of colors even if we don't have color vision as because they will appear to us as different shades of gray all of you are too young to have experienced a black and white television set but if you watch a colorful film in a black and white television set you can certainly distinguish the color of the clothes that people are wearing by diff- because they will appear as different shades of gray so carl von frisch decided that i'm going to test prove take this problem solve this problem and again he did the simplest possible thing the simplest possible thing he argued if the bees are really distinguishing between blue and green because they appear to the bees as two different shades of gray what is the simplest thing i can do he went to the market and he bought every shade of gray pa- paper with every shade of gray possible and he said the bees must confuse between blue and any one of the shades of gray at least that happened so he gave them an array of gray shades and the bees never made a mistake they always went to the blue and did not choose any of the gray now you can say this is preliminary yes it was preliminary but eventually other people showed so this had a happy ending shockingly of course one has refused to accept von frisch's results and insisted that it was possible to demonstrate that old claims of lubock as well as recent ones by von frisch according to which bees can be trained to certain colors are wrong altogether not a single fact is known that could even make plausible the notion of a color sense in bees though may, may, my investigation uh, through my investigation this assumption has been terminally refuted imagine the most distinguished scientists of the day publishing this after von frisch had done his work and that is why the young von frisch stuck to his position and eventually von hess was forgotten in fact when i give this lecture ask anybody in the audience have anybody heard of von hess nobody has heard of von hess almost everybody has heard of von frisch and he got the nobel prize now of course some of you may say oh he should have used a spectroscope he should have used this and that yes. of course people have done that the famous scientist otrum he the physiologist now he has obtained direct evidence that there is actually trichromatic color vision in the bees he actually inserted electrodes into the receptors of they and he showed that they have three different kinds of receptors slightly different from humans humans have three different receptors but they are for blue green and red and honey bees in fact have uv blue and green and they are blind in the red but you can actually detect these particular senses now many people are impressed by this experiment but by not by von frisch experiment but i keep telling you otrum did not get the nobel prize it's von frisch who got the nobel prize this is just confirmation von frisch had already shown it. and this is supposed extremely expensive experiment it only proved what von frisch had already shown now my students don't usually stop at this and i don't want you to stop at this my students said let this is we are giving the bees a very simple job anyway von frisch had already shown they have color vision so we want to make the life of the bees more difficult so i said okay find a way of making it more difficult so in one year the student said we will 
train, tell the bees to go to blue in the morning but green in the afternoon? Can they learn this and remember which time of the day, which color they should go? Answer is yes. When they were trained for blue in the morning and green in the afternoon, in the morning they went to blue, the same bees in the afternoon they went to green. So not only the bees have color vision, understand the color, remember the color, but they are able to see the time. Blue in the morning, green in the afternoon, they are able to do it. Another set of, sorry, this is, this is the slide. Blue in the morning, green in the afternoon. Another set of students said, we want to make life even more hard for the bees. The food box is here and a few meters away is their nest. We put their nest also in a box and we tell them that when you come to the food, you should go to blue. When you go back home, you should choose green. And they do that. And it takes them only a second or two to fly from the food to the nest. But they know, now I'm at the nest, I must use blue. Now uh, I must use green. Now I'm at home, I should use green. And they're able to make this choice. Okay, time to take questions. Are there uh, questions? Venkatesh, you've written something about a maze. Can you ask your question? Yes, sir. Like, if we want it to be more difficult, we can simply like put a maze-like thing with one laser guiding, like a mirror maze with one laser guiding the right direction and uh, other colors, like blue, or means other colors which are wrong. So if the bee follow the right track, it means like that is a certain proof that it can not only detect the light on the screen, it can also detect the uh, incoming <laughs> eyes. Yes. Not. yes, you can do the experiments and people have done these experiments. If you have the ability to do these experiments, do these experiments. And people have done. There is, today there is no doubt about these results. But I am much more impressed by the simplest possible experiment. But yes, you're right. People have done these experiments. The study of color vision honeybees has progressed enormously. We now know a great deal. Today, they, many people do experiments on this, which cost huge amount of money. Pondfish didn't spend any money. Okay, sir. And so one more thing. Yes. Like the fishes have, I mean, the, sorry, the bees have... Uh, means UV um, and those two colors. So can we conclude that bees have broader range of color than us, but less contrast? No, no, no. It's just that it's shifted. See, the, the spectrum is just shifted. We have three primary colors, blue, green, and red. They have three, that means we have three kinds of cones in our brain, in our brain which are sensitive to, tuned to blue, green, and red. They have three types of cones, but they are tuned to UV, blue, and green. And that is, it is just shifted in the spectrum to the left so that they don't have a peak for red, but we don't have a peak for UV. So for us, UV, we are blind to UV. We don't see UV as a color. They don't see red as a color. In fact, uh, Dawkins has a very nice statement. He says, the bees would call red as ultra green. Because on this side, they don't see it. So for them, so they also have three cones, but they're, in fact, these tunings have now been very well, well studied. That's why I put, I put this graph. So like, that means we can see the light ranging from 350 nanometer to 750 nanometer. Correct. They can see from like before 300 yes. and to 650, 650 exactly. something. Exactly. So exactly. They have broader exactly. range of like, uh, means. It's not broader. It's just shifted. It's not broader. It's just shifted. It's okay. just shifted. Here it's you know, the peak here. You can see this peak is so it's just shifted. Yeah, there is a slight difference here, but basically the more important point it is shifted. You can they have see we don't have for UV and they don't have for red. They, they don't have for red. Yeah. Okay. There is a slight I, difference. What you are saying, I think, is this width is more than sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it is slightly, yes. Yeah, it is slightly true. But the more important thing is that the cones are of different sensitivity. This is also probably slightly. Okay, and very interesting. So you see, important. what is the implication of this? A flower looks very different for a bee than it looks to us. In fact, many flowers who are, according to von Frisch, are brightly colored in order to attract bees, they have all kinds of interesting patterns on their flowers, which we are blind to. You now use a UV filter and take a photograph, you'll find all kinds of patterns on the petals in the middle, 
in fact, directing the bees to go towards the pollen grains, which we don't see at all. And the bees see them the, for them. So plants have evolved patterns in which are visible in the ultraviolet. Because plants are not evolved to please us. They are evolved to please bees. Mm, sir, does it take more energy to like show any other color than white? Like brightly, does it take more energy for a plant to produce bright colored flowers than producing a means normal yes, you know, there are se uh, several pigments they have to produce different kinds of pigments and they have to be deployed in the correct place in fact there are very detailed patterns so i'm sure it takes a uh, it's much more complicated to produce a multicolored very specific kind of pattern than to have one uniform everywhere mm -hmm. I, I i have not done the experiment i can easily imagine that it is much more complicated to do that uh, but, you know design a question from design an experiment to see whether that is true so actually, um, my question was that if we see from, uh, um, may I speak? Yeah, but after this, we'll take questions from others also. Yeah. So yeah. if we see from bees' perspective, yes. can we infer that a bee looks two flowers, one is brightly colored, and it, it infers that this one has more, like this uh, plant is better in survival, this one has more quality nectar. And think of an experiment. Is... Think of an experiment to answer this. all these questions are wonderful. In fact, even if somebody answered that question, I would say, don't go and read that. You think of an experiment, even if you don't do it. If you once a question comes to you, don't go rush to the internet and find the answer. Think of how you would answer that question, what the correct answer might be, then go to the internet and see whether you're on the right track or the wrong track. You should go to the internet to confirm or refute your own ideas, not to get facts ready-made given to you. So it's a very nice question. Think of how you will test this experiment. So again, is it, again, very often students ask me questions, and they, uh, it's a bite-sized question and a bite-sized ready-made answer. That should not be the attitude. The attitude is you think of how you'll find out or what might be the answer. Then you ask somebody or internet or uh, somebody else and find out. Don't Otherwise, what happens is, you know, you may be able to think of the answer, but you are giving credit to somebody else. You are also capable of thinking of answer. So always think of the answer yourself before you. I would, I would like someone to say, this is my question. This is how I'm going to do the experiment. This is the answer I expect. Now you tell me whether I'm on the right track. That is much more. Because then you get the credit for doing that. Anybody else has a question? Yeah, yeah. Priyanshu has a question. Uh, what is the reason that some bees fail to follow their trained path? Very good question. So what do you think? Priyanshu, can you, such you a want pity to... If I told you the answer, it's like, you know, I give you a book to read, a murder mystery, and they say, sir, who did the murder? Can you tell me? It would be as bad as that. I should not tell you. You think. What? Think about it. See, never ask, never get a ready-made answer to a question. Think about it. I, I would, you should not excuse me if I gave you the answer, because you should think about it. Uh, Indulekha has a question. Can bees sense magnetic field? Yes, they, they can. It's been very well studied. They can, absolutely. And they use that also. Uh, Omkar has a question. Uh, can bees differentiate between a red flower and leaves around it? I would guess so, because even though they can't see red, it will look, uh, the shade will look different. But such a simple experiment, you can do it tomorrow. Don't even worry about leaves. Take a green cardboard and take a red cardboard. You know, you don't have to keep the bees. You don't have the bees. Bees will come to you. Anywhere where bees are flying around, you give them some sugar, they'll come to you. You can do the experiment tomorrow. I don't know, sir, that, but I will do the experiment. Gita has a question. Yes. Uh, one second. Huh. One I second, I will... Okay, sir. Okay. Oh. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sir, just say that bees can feel magnetic fields. Uh, but uh, if they can, why can't human feel? What? What is the question? Bees can? If, if bees can feel magnetic field, then why don't man or uh, human can feel that magnetic field? Do you think we cannot? Yeah, I guess. Uh, find out. <laughs> find out. Okay. Okay, sir. See, there are two different things. One is whether we can perceive something. The other is whether we use it. There are two different things. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, Thank you. Geeta has a question. Will it ever be possible to decipher how bees see a flower compared to humans? Uh, what people have, what I know is what people have done is they have now a very sophisticated understanding of the actual thing that happens in the brain of the bee, the architecture of their eyes, the architecture of their brain, they're very detailed. In. Now, all of this they input into a model, into a computer model, and make the computer generate a photograph as it would appear to the bee as close as possible. So the more we understand how the bee brain works, the more sophisticated our computer program will become and the more realistic our image will become. And people have now published side by side, what does a flower look like to the bee and what does it look like to the humans? So people are able to, and the bee photograph is being continuously improved. The more we understand about the bee, the better that photograph will be. Uh, as of now, I can say that the photograph, the flower looks terrible to the bee. You can hardly see it. Very big. We, our, uh, that way our sight is much better. And bees, therefore, strongly uh, depend on smell as well as on sound, on near field vibrations. So they use their, what we might call their ears and their nose equally. In fact, probably even more than they use their eyes. You know, remember, bees have compound eyes. Lots of little simple eyes put together. They don't have the kind of eyes, they don't have the, the kind of eyes that we have. So their vision that way is poorer than ours, but they have color vision. They have three cones. Uh, one last uh, question. Yes. Uh, yes. As you say, uh, said earlier, flowers are brightly colored. Is it from the beginning that flowers are brightly colored or did evolution occur due to the bees or did bees evolve according to the color? Mm -hmm. Good question. Did uh, bees influence flowers or flowers influence bees? People have a very interesting question. A lot of work is being done on this question. And there are many different opinions. Clearly, this will be a feedback. So, you know, flowers will go one step, bees will go one step, flowers will go another step. So, this is clearly a uh, back and forth, back and forth, influencing each other. But there are uh, people who have reasonably good evidence that flowers direct that bees directed the flowers rather than the other way around. But that is only the very first step. Most of the whatever 65 million of years of evolution would be back end. You know, I, I play one card and you play the other card. I play one card, next card, you play the next card. That is, but in the very beginning, you know, there are people who believe that it is bees who influence the flowers, at least in the beginning. I think I mentioned yes. this in my book also. Okay, shall we? Yeah. Next experiment, experiment three. Yeah. Okay, now this I have deliberately chosen a slightly more complicated. The experiment is not complicated to do, but it's complicated for me to explain and for you to understand. So uh, I, you would, I hope you'll bear with me. This is an experiment, which is also on honeybees, but done by somebody else, actually done by a friend of mine called Mandyam Srinivasan. So this is about that. You remember, I already told you about the dance language of the bees. So here is a bee, which is uh, photographed while sitting on the flower. And you can see that it has collected lots of pollen on its hind legs. On the hind leg, there is something what we call the pollen basket. And the bee stuffs all the pollen in that, goes home and delivers the pollen. And as I said last time, the bees perform a dance. In fact, the bees perform two kinds of dance. There's a much simpler round dance where they just run round and in circles. And there's a, something called waggle dance, which is a little more complicated. In the waggle dance, the bees perform a figure of eight dance. So they run up like this, come back, run up like this, and come back. So this is called the straight run, and this is the return run. So there's a return uh, run, there's a return, sometimes left, sometimes right, but this is the so-called straight. Now, in this straight run, the bees vigorously vibrate their abdomens and wings. That is why it's called waggle dance. And information for the other bees is contained in that phase. So in the waggle phase, it is actually that vibration phase. That is the one that has the information. The bees perform round dance if food is very available very nearby, where they don't need to give information about how far to go. It's just like saying, there is food nearby, go and find it. And the bees will go and uh, scout around within about 50 to 100 meters, they'll find it very easily. No need to say which direction to go. But imagine the food is three kilometers away. There's no point in saying there is food, go and find it. There, the bees will tell you precisely go at this angle and find them. 
and that is what Paltrow discovered. In fact, he discovered that what bees do is outdoors, they measure the angle between the sun. This is the sun, and if you draw a perpendicular sun on the horizon, this is called the azimuth of the sun. So this is the azimuth of the sun, and let's say this is where the hive is, and this angle is what the bees measure and learn and remember. In this case, 80 degrees to the left of the sun, or in the direction of the sun, or opposite to the direction of the sun. They remember that and they use that angle to perform the dance. In the dance, of course, many bees dance in dark cavities where there is no light even, forget about seeing the sun. And there they switch from sun to gravity as their reference point. So the sun is, becomes now the gravity. So if the food they have found in the direction of the sun, the waggle dance will be when they are running up, up this way. If it is away from, away from the sun, then they will face down. And if it is left of the sun, they will face left of the vertical. So this is the vertical. They can sense gravity, of course, in dark cavity. So they will, if the bee is dancing, facing up, that means go out and go in the direction of the sun. If it is dancing down, then go out and go against the sun. If it is dancing 80 degrees to the left of the vertical, then go out and go 80 degrees to the left and find the food. And there is also information on how far to go. All of that is indicated. How far to go is remains on the how much of the waggle that they do, the amount of waggle that they do. And using this, so Kahn did a very simple experiment. And he, so he wanted to prove this. This is his idea, how they do it. Now, how to prove this? He trained the bees for food in different locations. And then he kept fresh food there and asked whether the bees who have not seen the food before, but who have watched the dance, will they find the food correctly? And he did an experiment which has become very famous Extremely simple, but very important experiment, very clever experiment, and his experiment was as follows. This is called, a, this is called become a, known as a fan-shaped experiment. So here is a little shed in which Ponfrich kept his bees. This is a road, and he trained the bees to a feeder here. This is the feeder in which he originally trained them. This is 250 meters away from the hive, and it is 50 degrees southwest. After the bees were trained, these bees were marked. They went and performed the dance and then Von Frisch took away those bees. Now there were only bees who had watched the dance. The original bee was not there. Now he wanted to test whether those bees can find this food. The important point is he didn't put a dummy new feeder here. In fact, he put it at 200 meters, not at 250 meters. And think for a minute why he did that. Secondly, he did not put one feeder, but he put an array of feeders all at 200 meters, but at slightly different angles. So he had an array of feeders here, a fan-shaped array of feeders. Two important points. One is not at 250. Another is several in this fashion. Now, since I don't have time to do the usual thing I do in my class, I will just tell you what the logic of this is. If we put the original feeder here, it is possible that the old bee has left some smell here. If the bee has understood that you should go in this direction, then the bee should be on the right track. And even if it bef goes before, it sh you should be able to prove that it's on the right track. And if you put some sugar here, the bees will find this is very close to 250 and say, ah, this is it. So it, if you come here, maybe the old bee has left some scent. Now, this is further proof that the bee is on the right track even before it finds the origin. Now, the reason for the array is you should expect in any biological system, there'll be some error, there'll be some mistakes. But if the direction information is accurate, then the error on either side should be roughly the same. There's no reason why I should go to uh, the southeast side more than the uh, northeast, uh, southwest side. So he predicted that most of the bees should go here. A few bees must go a little bit away and fewer and fewer. And that's exactly the result he got. Most of the bees went to the middle. This 91 bees went here. 35 and 29 bees went here. Few, even smaller number, 16 and 15 went here. Even smaller number, 4 and 6 went here. But you see the nice normal distribution showing that they have the information in the direction which is accurate, but small errors on either side. If this was asymmetrical, then there is a problem. If all the bees were, or if most of the bees were going here, there would have been a problem. So this is a very cleverly designed experiment, which we use now 
many people use all the time. So two critical things here. One is before the 250 meters, other is an array of feeders predicting a normal distribution of the errors. Questions? What if the bee uses olfactory signal and the new bees just went to food because they saw food? If the food was placed at 300 meters, why couldn't the food be placed at 300 meters, I think? That's precisely why the new feeder in the test situation was kept at 200 meters. Now, at this time, here, there is the old bee could not have left any olfaction. The olfaction is here. Okay. Sir, but like, um, may I speak? Okay. Uh, so if, sir, like the bees were coming, they saw uh, the food at 200 meter and they just went it. What if the food was at 300, the actual food at 300 meter before, means after the olfaction? Like how can we, we say that there was no olfaction here? It means there was no olfaction included in this. If you figure. had kept the new feeder at 300, then you would have doubt. Is it olfaction or is it that they knew? Whereas if you keep it at 200, there is doubt that doubt doesn't exist. Because now you are excluding olfaction. Because it's even before. That is why not only he did not keep at 300, he did not even keep at 250. Even before they reached the destination, question is, are you on the right track? Today, of course, people put uh, radio tags on the bees and they're actually able to follow the bees and they're able to say even at 10 meters there on the right track. You can see that. But Pontridge didn't need any of that. He, by doing this experiment, he showed that even before they reach the destination, I catch them and I ask, are you flying in the right direction? And the answer is yes, they are flying in the right direction. They do that even before they reach the destination. And this is also important that there is symmetry on either side. So there will be some errors, but most of the bees would go here. Okay. You are muted, Vidya. Sorry. Yes, sir. You can continue. Can I start? Okay. So the next experiment yeah. is also on bees, but it's a now. Uh, as I said, this is the one that is more complicated. I I had forgotten about the previous experiment. This is the experiment that was done by Mandiam Srinivasan, and experiment is very simple, but it is more difficult to explain, so I will try. Mandiam Srinivasan's question, Mandiam Srinivasan, by the way, was a, a master student from Indian Institute of Science, and then he went to, he studied electrical engineering. He was a master student from the Department of Electrical Engineering from Indian Institute of Science. Then he went to Yale University to do his PhD, and then he went to Zurich to do his postdoctoral work. That's where he got interested in bees, and before that he was an electrical engineer. And then he went to Australia, where he spent most of his, he's still there now in Australia. He did most of his research in Australia and he did this very nice experiment. And he had a very interesting question. His question is, the bees are able to come back and through their dance, they're able to indicate how far. That means they know how far. How do bees estimate the distance they have flown? How do they know how far have I flown? Okay. Now here I must clarify, when bees go out, they don't know where they are going. So they go randomly until they find food. And after they find food, they're able to fly straight back to the hive. Okay. And that is the distance that they actually measure. How do they measure this? Now, Fonfrisch was also asked this question. First of all, Fonfrisch showed that yes, they measure, they know, and they communicate. How do they communicate? In the so-called, what he called the tempo of the dance. So he calculated how many figure of eight they do in 15 seconds. And he plotted that and he showed that when the food is nearby, they dance very rapidly. As the food is further and further away, they dance more slowly. And there is a negative relationship between the so-called tempo of the dance and the distance to the feeding station. The question is, how do the bees know? This is what they do. This is what they tell you. But how do they know in the first place? And this is an interesting question. Distance estimation, a hypothesis was proposed by two people called Esch and Burns in 1996. Before that, Pond Frisch had a theory, which turned out to be wrong. 
Upon fresh, honeybees are widely believed to assess feeder distance by the energy spent in foraging flight. Pondfish had a theory that by the time they forage and come back, if they are very hungry, they think they have flown a great deal. If they have exhausted their food. Before going out, they drink honey and they go out and come back. And if the honey is exhausted, that means they have flown a great deal. But this is, turns out not to be true. However, a critical review of this energy hypothesis, so-called energy hypothesis, reveals many inconsistencies in the experiments from which it was derived. In fact, new evidence shows that the energy hypothesis is not correct. So, Ash and Burns proposed a very simple new hypothesis. It may sound complicated, but it's really very simple. It's really based on common sense. The new hypothesis is called optic flow hypothesis. And what they meant was that the bees measure the speed of image motion on their eyes. So, if you fly a great deal of distance, a great deal of image has passed by. And that's how they estimate distance. So this sounds much more complicated than that, but actually it is a much simpler way. And let me explain this by referring to my favorite author, Sherlock Holmes. I don't know how many of you read Sherlock Holmes, but if you read Sherlock Holmes and if you read a story called Silver Blaze, you will find the following passage. And so happened, it happened that an hour or so later, I found myself in the corner of a first class carriage flying along en route to Exeter, while Sherlock Holmes, with a sharp, eager face, framed in his ear flap traveling cap, dipped rapidly into the bundle of fresh papers which he had procured at Paddington. We had left reading far behind us before he thrust the last one of them under the seat and offered me his cigar case. At this point, I usually say smoking is injurious to health. The story continues. We are going well, said he looking out at the window and glancing at his watch. Our rate at present is 53 and a half miles an hour. I have not observed the quarter mile post, said I. So, Watson says, I have not counted the quarter mile post to be able to say how fast we are going. Sherlock Holmes said, neither have I. But the telegraph posts on which nothing is written are 60 yards apart and the calculation is a simple one. If more telegraph posts go by, you have gone further. If fewer telegraph posts go by, you have gone less distance. Okay. That is what the bees are expected to do. As you can see here, this is Mandiam Srinivasan. He devised a simple experiment to test this theory. His argument was, if this is what the bees are doing, then if I can somehow fool the bees, many experiments in animal behavior, Vidya will tell you, depend on fooling the animals. If you fool the animals, you can understand how their brains work. Because there are certain things they will get fooled by and certain things they will not get fooled by. And from that, we try to understand how their brains work or how their minds work. Very often, fooling, and this is a lot of fun, I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, you all fool each other, so you can fool animals. That's more fun than fooling each other. So, Srin wasn't decided to fool the bees in the following. He said, I'm going to make the bee fly some distance, but I'm going to make it experience much more optic flow than would be appropriate for this distance. And, and therefore, I'm going to fool the bees and I'm going to see if the bees actually overestimate the distance. And he did that again, but extremely simple. He took some pieces of cardboard and made a tunnel and he went to his computer and he wrote a simple program and made it to generate some patterns like random patterns. And he cut it, printed it on a piece of paper and pasted it inside the tunnel. And he made the bee fly through this tunnel. Now, because this pattern is so close to the bee's eye. This wall is so close, a lot more image motion will happen than when the bee flies outdoors. So even when the bee has flown a short distance, they must think they have flown a great distance. This was his prediction. The experiment was very simple. Nothing was needed. Some cardboard and some paper. And he made the bees fly. And he did only four experiments. But the four experiments were so cleverly designed. That's what I want to show you. Just four experiments. He had the bees in his shed, just like Ponfrish had. He did four experiments. In one experiment, he had the bees. Let's take experiment number one. Here, he had the bees fly through this tunnel. This tunnel was six meters long, but the feeder, the food was kept at the beginning of the tunnel. So the bees will not experience increased uptick flow, although they will experience the tunnel. So this is what we call a control experiment. In experiment two, there is a tunnel, there is a pattern, 
they flow through, but the food is at the end of the tunnel. That means they will experience the tunnel. Third experiment, very interesting. Tunnel, food at the end, but patterns are parallel to the axis of the flight of the bee. If there are parallel lines, you don't experience any image motion. So, again, you see how it's going step by step. Here the bees experience tunnel, but no image flow. Here, tunnel and image flow. Here, tunnel and image, but the wrong kind of image, which does not make them overestimate the distance. And finally, just out of bravado, he said, not even this far, I'll keep it very close to the hive. Just six meters away from the hive, the tunnel is still six meters. Even now, I will predict that they will overestimate the distance. So, just based on these four experiments. Now, remember, I already told you, if the food is nearby, the bees will do a round dance. If it is far away, they'll do a waggle dance. Now, this is six meters of tunnel. Maximum distance is 35 meters. So, total distance that the bees have ever flown is 41 meters. For 41 meters, the bees should always perform only a round dance, no waggle dance. But Trin was predicted that here they will do round dance because they have not experienced up to the flow. Here they will do waggle dance. Here they will do round dance. Here they will do waggle dance. Even though it's only 12 meters, they will do waggle dance because this six is considered very high. You follow the predictions? Round dance here because the food is the beginning of the tunnel. Waggle dance because it's the end of the tunnel and there are patterns which will generate optic flow. Food is the end of the tunnel, but the pattern will not generate optic flow. So round dance. Experiment four, even though the total is only 12 meters, waggle dance because optic flow here. That's exactly what it was. Experiment one, round dance. Experiment two, mostly waggle dance. Experiment three, mostly round dance. Experiment four, mostly waggle dance. Exactly as you predicted. Now, at this stage, I would have rushed to publication. He said, no, no, no. There's a lot more juice in this data which I should squeeze. No more experiments, but there are a lot more information because he had video recorded this piece and he could measure the duration of the waggle dance. So he could even find out how far are the bees actually indicating when they perform waggle dance, what are they indicating? Because they cannot be indicated 41 meters. So what are they indicating? So I can actually measure that and through that I can calibrate their odometer. Odometer is an instrument which is measured, which is used to measure distance, which you have in your cars. Okay. And he said the bees must have an odometer and that must be working on the basis of image motion on the retina. And I can calibrate. I can find out by knowing how much. Because here my bees have flown 41 meters with tunnel. Here 12 meters with tunnel. Here 41 meters without, essentially without tunnel because no patterns are here in the beginning. So he can, I can make a simple calculation. The simplest possible calculation. His argument is very simple. First, he said, in order to calibrate, I must know what the bees do in nature when there is no tunnel. So he did one more experiment in which he made the bees fly different distances, offered them food at different distances and find out what is the waggle duration for each distance. And he drew a standard graph. This is distance, this is waggle duration. So you see, you get a straight line. Now from this, what is the advantage of this other line? You can read off. So given this distance, this should be the waggle duration. Given this waggle duration, so given x, I can read off y. Given y, I can read off x. So this is a standard. So now in his experiment, if the bee shows some waggle distance, I draw a line from that, whatever that is, to this line and draw a perpendicular. I know what distance the bee is indicating. By knowing what duration of waggle they have shown, I know what the bees have indicated. That is the simplest, simple logic based on the standard graph. He made the following uh, calculation. In experiment two, the bees, bees flew 35 meters in the natural environment, followed by six meters in the tunnel, total of 41 meters. Okay, experiment one. Now, but their dances revealed a mean duration as long as 529 milliseconds. And this 529 milliseconds corresponds to a flight of 230 meters, as you can read off from here. 529 means 230 meters. A flight of 6 meters in the tunnel was therefore perceived as equal to a flight of 195 meters. Why 195? 230 minus 35. 35 is real. 
that 230 is the one inside the tunnel. So 235 minus 30 is 195, and that 195 is actually 6. 6 was perceived as 195 for the tunnel. Similarly, in experiment 4, the B this should. Yeah, so that I was experiment two. Now, in the, the other one was experiment four. Remember, we kept close to the hive. In experiment four, the bees flew only six outdoor, six inside. You see here, experiment four, six outdoor, six inside. This was signaled by a waggle dance of 441 milliseconds. This he had measured from his video recordings, which represent distance of 184 meters. So 441, if you drop a perpendicular here, is 184. But <clears throat> The six meter flight in the tunnel was therefore perceived <coughs> equivalent of outdoor flight 178, which is 184 minus six, because six was real, 184 was the tunnel. So the tunnel six meter 178 became 186 meters in the outdoor environment. Now, therefore, now you have to calculate how much image motion actually happened on the eye of the bee. And that is again a very simple calculation. He, in his cardboard tunnels, the diameter was 11 centimeters. <clears throat> so the bee, if it flies in the middle of the tunnel, I hope somebody will ask you, uh, will ask me, how do you know that the bee will fly in the middle of the tunnel? I hope you'll ask me, but now I'm going to assert that the bee flies in the middle of the tunnel, but I hope you'll ask me or you'll answer me how you know that, uh, how you can expect that. So if it flies in the middle of the tunnel, then on each side, the distance is 5.5 centimeters. Thus, one centimeter of forward motion would cause an image on the wall of the tunnel to move backwards by 10.3 degrees, which all of you will immediately be able to calculate. This is what it will be, okay? And inverse, one by 5.5, you will get 10.3 degrees. So if the B moves forward by one centimeter, the image on its eye will move backwards by 10.3 degrees. With that knowledge, Therefore, six meters of forward motion in a tunnel would generate 6,180 degrees of image motion. A six meter flight in the tunnel corresponds to a flight of 186 meters by taking the average of those two. Therefore, 186 meters of outdoor flight is encoded by a waggle duration of 446 milliseconds. Therefore, as you can, you can again, uh, check here, you can take that 186 and you can draw and you will get this and therefore one millisecond of waggle dance encodes 6180 divided by 446 that is 13.9 degrees of image motion in the eye. This is the calibration. So the honeybee eye's odometer is so designed that one millisecond of waggle dance means the watcher should know that they should go like this much because it encodes 13.9 degrees of image motion. This is a bit involved to absorb at one time, but I know that this lecture will be recorded and you can go back to it again. Even if you don't do that, all of this is in my book. So you can go and look at it again and try to understand it step by step. I have deliberately gone step by step. In case you are not sure, please go back to this again and see what the logic is. Questions? Uh, so Omkar has asked, do all the bees take part in the dance? Uh, let's be. Let's break down the question now. What bees do is typically a few bees go out in search of food. We don't. They don't know where the food is. They go out. These are called scout bees. If they find food, they will come back and perform a dance. Now, several bees will watch this dance, and in a normal healthy hive, you can expect that several scouts have come back and they're all dancing and telling, "Go here, go there, go there," because they all found things. Now, the interesting thing is the vigor with which the bee will dance, that is the, how long it will dance, not the speed. Speed tells you the distance, but how long they dance reflects how much food they have found. So if a bee has found a lot of food, it will keep on dancing for a long time, so it will get more audience. And this audience will then go to that food. If a bee has found a little bit of food, it will dance for a very short period of time. It will get only maybe two members of the audience, and they will go in circle. So you can see how bees allocate their resources depending on how much food is available. So the dancer is not only telling what, the dancer tells you what I have found because she's smelling of that flower. The watchers actually smell the dancer, not just smell the dancer. From time to time, the dancer will stop and regurgitate a little bit of saliva 
a little bit of the nectar to the watch to the watcher so the watcher drinks that nectar and says ah i must go to you i have she has found a eucalyptus tree or she has found an orange orchard that she knows now by knowing whether it is round or waggle she knows it near or far by knowing the waggle duration she knows how far and by seeing how long she is dancing she is not stopping at all she is very enthusiastic which she must have found a lot of food there must be a very large orange orchard all this information is given to the now the dancers are free to do what they want some dancers are lazy they say ah nice dance i enjoyed i had a good time now i'll go and have a nap sure some bees will say this bee is indicating a very far distance i don't want to go there let me go to this dancer she is indicating nearby i'll go there or another bee may say this bee is indicating a direction here and this one here i want to go here so the dance the followers are free and they distribute themselves freely but the net result is that sufficient number of bees go to different feeders different sources of food depending on how much food is available and the colony as a whole is able to gather lot of this food so all bees you know, and some bees scout bees they go and say oh, i found only one flower no point i come back and i don't dance that's all so much so every bee may not dance every and every bee may not watch the dance there are a lot there are 50000 bees in the colony they are doing other things they say oh, i am cleaning you know there is a dead bee here through the dead body i am busy i am not going to watch the dance so it's all distributed uh, anupriya has a question due to optic flow and hence the altered dancing pattern of the earlier bees in experiments 2 and 4 were in there more bees going in the wrong directions anupriya do you want to Uh, clarify what exactly this means. See, this this does not indicate direction. This is only indicating distance. Optic flow has nothing to do with direction. Direction is based on the angle at which the bee is holding its abdomen while dancing. The distance is indicated by the duration of the waggle phase of the dance. And here, what is being manipulated? The optic flow is supposed to help the bee to estimate the distance, not the direction. So there is no danger. of confusing the bees and making them go in the wrong direction by increasing or decreasing optic flow the danger is to make them go very far away but here after the bees are flown we are looking at the dots uh venkatesh has a question are yeah. bees aware of their own velocity if we keep this experiment going on for generations will the bees slowly modify their timing yeah please come back and ask me this about 2 million years from now i'll give you the answer evolution that way is a very slow process yes surely it can happen there are certain things which actually happen in our lifetime we can watch everybody knows that when people try to control with mosquitoes people introduce ddt and initially they had great success but very quickly mosquitoes become resistant to ddt and then quickly that resistance gene spread and within a few years all mosquitoes are resistant to ddt so here is an example of evolution that happened quite rapidly now this kind of evolution i don't know how long it will take it may take a long time but it is possible to actually study rates of evolution in laboratory uh, you can ask professor tnc vidya in her uh, animal behavior unit there are people who grow drosophila flies in the lab generation after generation and actually track and study the rate of evolution this particular thing may be more difficult because bees are harder to breed and this particular thing may take a long time but in principle yes so again this is another thing you should realize you have a question about whether evolution happens and whether we can observe it in order to answer the question you must change your system you must not you must say what is the organism that i can best study if i want to observe evolution in action you want an organism which is easy to breed and which has very short generation time because remember the rate of evolution is not based on real time it's based on number of generations because it changes happen in every generation so the more the generations the more chances that evolution happen so you want something that that's why people use bacteria they divide every 20 minutes so in a few weeks you have gone through many many generations drosophila is not bad at all 14 days in a few months you have many generations uh, professor amitabh joshi has flies which has been been uh, kept in the lab and have gone through what 700 800 900 generations now to do that with bees would be very very hard bees are difficult to breed so you have to change your but fact is that in many systems using like bacteria in drosophila in cnorhabditis alexandris in many other cases 
you can actually observe the process of evolution in the laboratory. Priyanshu has a question. How is such a sophisticated method of communication known to bees without any education? Yeah. Do skills like these get transmitted through genetic material or do they learn from the older individuals? See, see how useless education is. <laughs> yes, in this case, the bees have an instinctive knowledge of this. If you study animal behavior, you will find that certain things animals do by instinct without having to learn. Some things they learn. Take the bees itself. They don't learn that they have to dance. They don't learn how to dance. They don't learn how to convert so many degrees of optic flow motion into so many shaking of the abdomen. This is all instinctive. But where is food to be found? They learn. Each animal is like that. In humans, we learn many things, but there are many things we don't learn. You touch a heart, a heart object, you will remove your hand immediately without having to learn. Okay? So, every animal has a mixture of innate instinctive behaviors and some acquired learned behaviors. The honeybee dance, all the components, as far as we know, are innate instinctive components and not learned components. The first dance that a bee does in its life is perfect. So a bee which is, you know, bees start foraging at about three weeks, okay, 21 days. Now, a 21-year-old bee will not have an imperfect dance 20, compared to a 35-day-old bee because it is fully formed and available to them. So we use the following language. Certain things are hardwired. They come ready-made. You have a program. Whichever. Other things are soft-wired, where you have to learn or you can modify something. And animals have a mixture of these different kinds of things. As far as the dance language is concerned, it seems to be entirely hardwired. And therefore, no education is needed. No education is useful. Uh, Akash uh, has... Uh an answer to your question. Maybe three of the tunnel, bees go through the middle of the tunnel. Ah, yes, good, good. Tell me. So he he thinks it's because, he's asking whether it's because of the symmetry of the tunnel that they fly in the middle. Because of the? Symmetry. Sim that Maybe. the tunnel is symmetric. How Akash, can you do you want to elaborate? You asymmetric tunnel? What is an asymmetric tunnel? I think he's talking about the patterns on the sides. Uh, Akash, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, sir. I'm talking about the patterns of that tunnel. Yes. Okay. Now, let I'll ask you one more question. If you answer that correctly, then I think you have understood. Now, you are right. Let me, let's accept your answer. Because of the symmetry of the pattern, they fly in the center. Now, tell me, what will you do if you want the bees to fly closer to the left wall of the tunnel than to the right wall of the tunnel? What will you do? I want to make, I want to force the bees to fly closer to the left wall than to the right wall. What will you do? I have to change the pattern. Tell me how. In the, what will you change? Yes, that, uh, that is critical. That is a critical thing. Yes, change, yes. But what will you change? Think uh, about it. Very contrast of the color. No, no contrast. Don't worry about contrast. Just look at the density of the pattern. The amount of image, of image flow is simply based on the density of the pattern. Don't worry about contrast. Let's keep the contrast. Okay? So, it's a shame if I tell you because I would like all of you to think about this. But very briefly, I can tell you one thing. If the bees, if the pattern is symmetric all around, if the bee flies in the middle, then there will be same amount of image flow on the left and the right. Right? From this, you can conclude that if I want to fly in the middle, what should I do? I should fly in such a way that the same image motion is happening on both eyes. Therefore, if I want to, if I have an asymmetric pattern, then I should fly somewhere such that the image motion is same on both sides. Now imagine on the left side, the pattern is very dense. That means a lot more image flow here. Here there's very sparse, less image flow here. I want to make it equal. What do I do? I move to the right. So I move closer to the side where the pattern is sparse and away from the slide where it is dense in order to equalize these two. And this is not a this is not trivial. This is extremely important. I'm going to tell you later on that people have used this kind of optic flow mechanism in artificial flying machines. And they want the machines to fly in a certain way. And this is actually very useful to control your artificial machine. You want to make it fly in a certain way. You can do that. 
In fact, this wisdom from this is actually now being applied for making artificial flying machines, unmanned flying machines. And all of this logic is being used. Um, Ira asks, is there a way to describe this innate instinctive behavior at the biochemical and genetic level? Molecular. Why don't you go one step further? Sure, there is. There is. Again, what did I say earlier? For each question, there is a more most suitable organism to study. So you may work with honeybees, you may come up with a question which is hard to answer in bees, but you can answer also. So there are many examples where people have actually understood the physiological and then the genetic and then the molecular basis of how that behavior is performed. Yes, there is a way, it depends on the system. In many systems, for many examples, we understand in considerable physiological, genetic, and molecular detail how, how behavior is controlled. Uh, there's also a question, how does the waggle dance relate to the direction of the sun? I think she didn't follow. How does the? The waggle dance relate to the direction of the sun. Okay. So we'll quickly go back to that slide. Yes. So this is the diagram which will help you to understand that. This is an outdoor arena. Imagine that the beehive is here. And this is outdoor. There is a road here. And this is the horizon. And the sun is here right now. So now you imagine that you are dropping a perpendicular from the sun to the horizon. This point you note, this is called the azimuth of the sun. Now the bees are trained to collect food from three different sources. One is feeder one, which is in the line of the azimuth of the sun, but away from the sun. Feeder two is 80 degrees to the left of this line. So draw a line from the sun to the horizon and the horizon to the height. Now you will find that feeder 1 is further away, feeder 2 is to the 80 degrees to the left, and feeder 3 is towards the sun. Now you mark these three bees, three, three different colors, blue, green, and red. You can mark the bees. Then you wait for the bees to come back home and actually see what kind of dance they perform. You will find that the bees which have gone to the red feeder, that is the feeder away from the sun, they are dancing facing down inside the hive. So down means away from the sun. Bees which have gone here are dancing 80 degrees to the left of vertical, left of gravity. And bees which have gone to feeder 3, which is in the direction of the sun, are facing up. So up means go in the direction of the sun, down means go in the opposite direction, and then depending on the angle, all 360 degrees can be quoted. 20 degrees to the left, 30 degrees to the left, 55 degrees to the right, everything can be encoded. That is how it is encoded. So the bees somehow measure the angle between the azimuth of the sun, their hive and the feeder. They memorize that angle. They convert that angle with respect to the vertical inside the hive. Because in the hive, there is no sun. They convert and their conversion formula is up means in the direction of the sun. Down means again uh, away from the sun. Left means left of the sun. Right means right of the sun, depending on the angle. That is the system that the bees use and we can do. Therefore, by watching the dancer ourselves, we can find the food. Because we can decode. In fact, we can do exactly what the bees do. Because we can smell the bee. We know what she has found. We can look at the angle, we know in what direction to go. We can look at the tempo of the dance, we know how far to go. We can even look at the duration of dance and say whether it's worth going or not, how much food there is, and we can go. And I don't have time to tell you this, but what is the proof of what I'm saying? Is there a proof of what I'm saying now? The proof is found, was found by somebody saying, yes, if that is true, then I must be able to train a robotic bee to perform the dance and make the real bee go to there. So I take a, I make a robot bee and I make it dance 50 degrees to the right of the vertical. This is a robotic bee that has never gone anywhere. But the bees which watch this dance, we, our prediction is 
they will fly out of the hive and fly 50 degrees to the right of the sun this has been proved you can do it. experiments have been done so we understand if we can make a robot do what we have understood that means we have understood okay uh, i think there is one final question sure. uh, in ke- on a cloudy day do uh, bees have a way to communicate the location of food the person is asking this question i suspect knows the answer or not i don't know what the answer uh, abhijit do you want to do you know the answer answer that if you don't know the answer i don't know the answer you tell me i don't know sir you don't But know the answer okay i have doubt that uh, i have doubt yeah. that it only yes takes sun as the main thing correct. for uh, correct. locating the food correct in case it can also take any other source also sir take what you said gravity but any other source what like what a, like light from any other source light or sense of smell like that hey, wait a minute wait a minute many other some, ways. wait 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 light from any other source won't do because it's not light that's matter the sun has a position light from any other source will be any other position so how do i decide it 80, 80 degrees to left of the sun so any other light won't do it has to be sun right it has to be light coming from a source okay so so uh, sorry sir can i uh, add that there's a similar question so i'll also tell you that other sure. question yeah that uh, i mean what about bees that forage at night oh good so yeah unfortunately we have this two hour session so i have no choice but tell you the answers but if you are enrolled in my course i would never give you this answer i'd ask you to go and find out and tell me the answer and then we would discuss it that's a much more interesting way to do it but i can't promise to come back to you after you find the answer so the next best option is let me give you some glimpses of the answer but go and find out more yes ponfrish very much worried about this and he showed that bees can continue to dance continue to communicate accurately continue to forage even on cloudy days and he suspected that bees even though they cannot see the sun directly they may be able to infer the position of sun by the pattern of polarization of light in the sky and he showed that that is what they do and today by much more sophistication we know that honey bees unlike us their brain is able to detect the plane of polarization right you know what that means when light is coming from the sun when it hits dust particles it gets scattered okay otherwise it is not polarized so by looking at the plane of polarization right we now using instruments we can detect where the sun is even though we cannot see the bees have such an instrument in their head using plane of polarization right they can infer where the sun is they will still dance with respect to the sun even though they cannot see the sun because they predict where the sun is even more interesting sometimes the sky is so overcast that the plane of polarization right also cannot be detected still the bees have no problem now the bee see bees always have a backup system simple sun if sun is not available then i'll go to the plane of polarization see bees are a bit like me if it is first let's do the simple thing only if it doesn't work let me buy a complex complex instrument so if i why do i need this polarization detecting instrument it's unnecessary if i can see the sun i will use that when the bees cannot see the sun they will infer where the sun is using a plane of polarization but if they cannot infer that also they have another backup system they would have also learned the landmarks and they know if this big tree is here at 4 o'clock in the evening then i know that the sun is there so now i can see the tree and i know the time and therefore i infer that the sun is there how do they know this one this one cannot be instinctive right because the trees may be cut and another tree may come this they learn every day they learn the landmarks around there in their flying area and then they can infer where the they still use the sun but the predicted position of the sun based on prominent landmark and the time of the day of course you as you know time of the day is very important even more people ask me but sir they went flew in the morning sun has moved in the afternoon what happens you can think sun is the worst thing to take because he is moving all the time but sun is best thing to take because sun has always been there trees can cut and go mountains also can go away bees have been using this system for 65 million years so they are most faithful 
signal is the sun but there is only one trouble the sun he is restless he keep moving no problem the bees have learned this the bees are able to adjust so you make the bee learn the position of sun in the morning and make it fly in the evening it knows it corrects that now i saw the sun there but now it's 4 o'clock in the evening so the sun must be there and they will use that new position of sun either to dance or to fly and fly so they combine their knowledge of the trajectory of the sun. how do they fly the bees at night very good question this experiment is also done by in fact by fred dyer who did it while a visitor in our own department i was witness to these experiments he had three hypotheses he said he you know he came from america in america of course there were no native bees but uh, europeans brought european bee there and he studied european bees for his phd during his phd and european bees don't fly at night so he wanted bees which fly at night indian bees fly at night apis dorsata these rock bees they fly at night so he came to india to do our part one chapter in his phd thesis and he had three hypotheses he said your bees fly at night there are three possibilities one is that they use the moon that's one possibility the other possibility is they simply remember the last position of the sun when the sun went down like you know in my house there is a balcony here and my wife is very fond every day my wife goes to the balcony and watches the sun go down that's all she can do in this lockdown period unfortunately but otherwise she used to go to europe and so on. now she goes to the balcony and every day she, and she finds that as the seasons change the sun is going down away and away so they everybody says the last so it's a it's a matter of language no if i say this is left all of you will say this is left so they remember the last position of sun and use that till next morning second hypothesis third hypothesis most unlikely hypothesis if the bees can track the trajectory of the sun morning to evening maybe they can also track the trajectory of the sun at night on the other side of the earth this was the most unlikely hypothesis and that's the one he proved so bees can actually infer where the sun is on the other side of it. so they have multiple backup systems last one the most interesting thing what do the sun do what do the bees do when the sun is exactly above your head how can you draw an azimuth it will go through your head what do the bees do important question all question important von frisch worried about this he said what do they, my theory says this but what do the bees do when the sun is exactly above head unfortunately von frisch lived in germany and the sun is not above head so he had to go to the tropics so he told one of his students martin lindauer that you should go somewhere in the tropics and do the experiment and martin lindauer got a grant from the german science academy and went to sri lanka close enough and he did the experiment and martin lindauer says beautifully he says i am so excited i did all, i trained my bees in the morning and i waited with bated breath to see what they will do at 12 o'clock what did they do they took a nap they just stopped foraging for a few minutes and afterwards the sun moved now they have an angle they started dancing so in in report, writing a report to the german science academy he gave a one line report nap <laughs> what do the bees do when the sun is overhead they take a break after a few minutes they start flying again okay do we have yeah. time for one yeah. more experiment yeah we one yeah. more yeah. okay yeah now we will talk about we have talked about wasps we are talking about bees now i'll talk about ants this is an ant which is called linopithema humil and this is the subject of the next experiment and this again started as a simple curiosity driven question jean louis denuberg from belgium asked the following question if there are two ways to go the ants walk they don't fly right now if there are two ways to walk from the nest to the food one is a short path and one is a long path we know that the ants somehow know that the short path is better and they always take the short path they avoid the long path and denuberg said but how do the ants do this how do they manage to do this he did he was a chemist so he did not think that the ants are intelligent they are smart they measure they measure what is the distance here what is the distance here and they know that it takes more energy nothing he said there is a 
he is a chemist he said is there a chemistry explanation to this and he came up with a simple chemistry based theory as to how the ants might be able to choose how do ants choose the shortest path he came up with a chemistry based theory and he proved the theory first thing he did was he brought the ants to the laboratory and he had a nest in the lab and a box simple box with nest a plastic box with nest the kind you use in the kitchen and another plastic box with food and he connected the nest box with the food box with two glass tubes one was short one was long and he said i now will study how the bees do the bees find the shortest path do they use the shortest path how do they do that now i could stop here but i will tell you actually this is not the apparatus he used he used a slightly more complicated apparatus where he had two such things one loop here one loop here and this is a question for you to think about why did he use <coughs> two loops and not one loop now here he found that he can make the bees go back and forth and his theory was the following we all know as he knew and we all know that when ants forage they lay a chemical trail they lay a pheromone trail which guides the other ants so his theory was simple two ants leave the nest at the same time and they take different paths to a food source quite randomly so initially they don't care they don't know which is long which is short they just randomly some go here some go there but they are all marking with pheromone the ants that took the shorter path just by chance will return and this train will return first and this train will be marked with twice as much pheromone as the path taken by the second ant which is yet to return so if you wait for a certain amount of time twice the number of trips have been made on the short path compared to the long path twice the amount of pheromone in the short path as compared to the long path so the next ant which comes out that s mate will now be attracted to the shorter path simply because of its higher concentration of pheromone nobody measured distance nobody decided short is better nobody did anything chemistry that's all that is the, therefore the colony's efficient behavior emerges from the collective activity of individuals who themselves are fairly stupid they are simply following basic rules i will lay pheromone i will follow the trails of others if you do if many ants just have these two rules whenever i walk i lay some chemical and wherever the chemical is higher i'll go there with that you will find this complex behavior and he proved this in fact doing very simple experiments uh, where he showed he he manipulated the ratio of the length of the short and the long arm when the ratio was equal they didn't choose anything when the ratio was 1.4 they didn't choose much but as soon as the ratio became 2 most of the ants use the shorter path he showed this both in monte carlo simulations as well as in real life experiments but he did one very critical experiment that's important he was not satisfied with this this seems perfectly fine it fits with his theory he was not satisfied he said uh, what i told you in the beginning find a way to disprove your own theory he said now i'll do an experiment which can disprove my theory my theory says because the ants which took the sh short path left more pheromone that one the ant didn't choose now how to disprove this theory this proves the theory but i have to disprove the theory potentially disprove the theory he said he decided to devise a simple clever experiment once it is told to you it is so obvious but you should think of such things once they tell you who is the murderer it's so obvious that he is the murderer but you have to think of before what he did was he said suppose i keep the short path closed for half an hour now the ants will only have the long path they will go on the long path and fill it with pheromone whatever they can now i'll open the short path the short path has zero pheromone nobody will go there so the ants will not be able to be using the short path they will stick to the long path the only difference is i open the short path half an hour later than the long path if that you know if the ants fail to use the short path then my theory is proved and that's what exactly what happened both in the simulations and in the real life situation once he opened the short path 30 minutes later he was able but the important point here the more another important point here is that this is so called complex behavior that is choosing the short or the long path is a complex behavior but that emerges from very simple rules nothing to do with the original target the target is that you should know that it is better to use short path because you spend less energy and you have more energy to make more eggs and more babies and guard darwinian fitness none of that is required simple rule is 
lay pheromone, follow the trails of others. That leads to complex behavior. This has become a major turning point. And in fact, even while he was doing this experiment, a computer scientist called Marco Dorigo said, ah, this kind of wisdom of the ants, what we would call lack of wisdom, they never measured, they don't know that short is better, nothing. They just lay trials and foolishly followed wherever there was pheromone. But this wisdom or lack of wisdom is very useful in computer science. In fact, he developed a whole sub-branch of computer science, which is actually called ant colony optimization. So when writing computer programs, they use the algorithms suggested by ants. And this field has just taken off. I'll just quote a few things from Marco Dorigo's and another person's thing. Two, three sentences, I don't have time. Marco Dorigo and his colleagues have adapted, have adopted ant-based routing to handle internet traffic. Simulation results indicate that their technique outperforms all existing routing methods, including the protocol currently used in the internet. Ant-based models are now being used by Southwest Airlines for the efficient routing of cargo. And Eric Bonnaby, another famous ant scientist who was hired by the French telecom industry because they wanted ant's wisdom through, through Bonnaby's wisdom. And he says, the ultimate application of ant-based routing methods might be on the internet where traffic is painfully unpredictable. The most powerful insight from swarm intelligence, this is called swarm intelligence. That is, there is no real intelligence, but everybody is doing the same stupid thing all the time and that leads to intelligence. Is that complex collective behavior can emerge from individuals following simple rules. Possible applications of swarm intelligence may be limited only by the imagination. Questions? And if necessary, we can drop six, experiment six. I would prefer to answer questions than tell another experiment. <clears throat> if there are no questions. Then sorry, then there was a question. I yeah. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, there was a question that I missed earlier from YouTube, uh, asking whether uh, retinal cells can uh, judge the Earth's magnetic field and whether that allows for locomotion of the no, bee. I, no, I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. The next and, one is uh, short. If I can take another five minutes or so, I can actually cover the sixth experiment. Yeah, okay. yeah, sure, sir. I, I, I'll first ask you a couple of questions for the, for this yeah, experiment. Sure, sure. And then, um, so Venkatesh has uh, an answer to your question about the two loops. Uh, uh, very good, very good. Are they using two loops to confirm that answer using the shortest path and not the one on the left or the right? That is one way, but for that, you could have also had two setups, one where the long is on the left and the other is the long on the right. You could have two setups. That's one answer. There is one more answer possible. That is one answer. The other answer is that they are not choosing the short path only when they're close to the nest or only when they're close to the food. Now you see here, the way it is interchanged, here the short path is left near the nest and here it is right to the nest. So it's some combination of left, right, also whether in near the nest and away from the nest. But you are, you are right. Uh, Soham has a question whether ants leave, the next ant leaves the colony after the first scout has returned. And how does this? Work? Not necessarily, not necessarily. So initially, a few ants will go out. They will all choose randomly. See, basically what the ants do, if they don't find a perceptible difference in the concentration of pheromone on the two sides, they'll choose whatever they can. So initially, if there is no concentration of pheromone, they'll do it randomly. But once pheromone builds up more in one and less in the other, then the probability, again, it's not certainty. The probability that an ant will choose one path is proportional to the difference in the concentration between the two paths. Okay. You can, yeah. Do I do I have a few minutes? To... Yeah, yeah. I because the next session we have a gap for the okay. before the next. Okay. This will take uh, less than ten minutes. Can I sure. do that? Okay. Sure. Uh, the last experiment is on social was. I mentioned in the beginning, you know that uh, tin virgin was were ordinary solitary was. Mine are social was. I'm very proud of my social was. This is the social was I study. It's called Ropalidia marginata. All my students have done their PhDs. Many students have done their PhDs on this. This is what we work with. And I want to just illustrate one experiment from this, a very simple experiment. Now, in ants, bees, and wasps, which live in these social colonies, there is one very remarkable thing. These colonies are basically 
colonies of female ants, female bees and female wasps. The males do not participate in social life. They do not do any work. They are born, they mate, donate sperm and die. And therefore, the males are called lazy. Uh, you would have heard the expression lazy drones. In, this is true in ants, this is true in bees, this is wasps. Males don't work. And one of my PhD students, her name is Ruchira Sen, she was very unhappy with this situation. She said, why are males so lazy? I want to understand why they are lazy. She not only understood why they are lazy, but I'm happy to say she cured them of their laziness. That's the proof that she understood. The logic she used is very simple. This is Ruchira Sen on the right corner here. She studied this and she found that as in other social insects, Males have Ropalidae marginata, almost never. Now, females do many kinds of work. She said, let me take one example to compare males and females. And one of the important things that the female wasps do is they feed the larvae with food. You have to actually hand feed them, put food in their mouth all the time. And females are doing this all the time. Males don't do this. It is true that males leave, mate and die, but for about a week, they are on the nest of their birth. They don't, still they don't feed larvae in that one week. Of course, one possibility is that they are too young, but that she ruled out by saying that one week old females feed larvae. Why not one week old males? You can't, there's no excuse. So for that one week, at least when they are there, the same age females feed larvae, males don't. Why? Why do they? And she came up with three hypotheses. One hypothesis is, what's happening? Yes. One hypothesis is males are just stupid. They don't know how to feed the larvae. They don't know, so they don't do it. That's one possible. The second hypothesis, they have no food. Males don't hunt. Males depend on females to give them food. So females give them some food, they eat it, there is nothing left, I cannot give to larvae. So they are limited access to food. Third, very interesting, and this is what people say, oh, you should not think anthropomorphically. Sometimes it's very useful to think anthropomorphically for making a hypothesis. This is very anthropomorphic. She probably used her experience with human males and said, males don't feed because the females are doing such a good job anyway. Now, this is the worst kind of anthropomorphic thinking you can think of, but anthropomorphism is very useful to construct a hypothesis. Don't draw a conclusion based on anthropomorphism, but make your hypothesis. So, she had three hypotheses. Males don't know how to feed, they don't have enough food, or they don't feed, they know they have food, but may, females are doing such a better good job, why should I do this? She was able to very simple experiment. She was able to distinguish between these hypotheses. First experiment she did was very simple. She said, okay, males don't have food. Okay, I will give you food. So she took food in her forceps and hand fed the males. She kept on giving food to the males, much more than the females would give them. Now they had plenty of food till they didn't want any more. And she asked, now will you feed larvae? Sure enough, they started feeding larvae. That means they know how to feed. Okay, but they fed larvae only a little bit, not as much as the females. So it is true that they know how to feed, that hypothesis hold out. It is true that they have limited access to food is the problem, but it is not the only answer, not the only uh, solution to the problem, because even when given unlimited food, they don't feed as much as the females. <coughs> so she said, ah, now it must be this anthropomorphic hypothesis is correct. They don't do it because females are doing very well. Simple experiment. She removed all the females, left males, hungry larvae at the mercy of males who were overfed. Now you have males with a lot of food, no females, hungry larvae, they are begging for food. What will the males do? They fed as often as the females. So she was able to say part of the reason is they don't have access to food, but part of the reason is because females are so she was able to choose these two over that. I will just tell you the last part of the story, which is a bit sad. The reason is that even though males, the sad conclusion, of course, was that even though males fed as often as the females, the larvae were not happy. They died more often than when the females fed them. So this is requires it's another question, another experiment. You think of experiment that you might do to find out why the females die, even though the males feed them as often. But the fact is that she discovered why the males are lazy and she cured them of their laziness. The larvae were not happy, but Ruchira was happy. I was happy. Here is some data, but we don't have to go into the details. 
So she showed that the first hypothesis is wrong. Both these hypotheses are correct. And we actually were able to publish a paper with our anthropomorphic language. Males can feed larvae given an opportunity. That's the problem. They don't have an opportunity. Give males an opportunity. I personally, I think even in humans that's true. But that's that's a joke. So uh, questions before I come to my final slide with take home messages. Other questions? So far there are both male and female students are invited to ask questions. <laughs> Are there any questions? No, sir. No? Okay, so my last slide, take home messages. The process of science is as important as the product. If you just know what people have done, that's not useful. Try to find out how they found it. The answer to the question is not important. How do you find that answer to the question? There is a, in one of Satyajit Ray's very famous movies, he has this parody of modern day unemployed graduate. So then unemployed graduate, he's going from interview to after interview, people ask him all kinds of stupid questions. He cannot answer the question. He's not getting a job. And in one scene, there are lots of people sitting and they're throwing questions at him. Very rapid fire questions. One of the, and the questions are fairly stupid. One of them is, what is the way to the moon? Now that's a stupid question. What is a not stupid question? How can I find the way to the moon sitting on earth? That's a clever question. If you ask me what is the way to the moon, I'll tell you so many kilograms. End of story. Ask me how do I know? How can I sit on earth and estimate? We know fairly precisely what is the way to the moon. How do we know? Not much before Louis Armstrong. We knew the way to the moon. How? Oh, that is science. Knowing the way to the moon is not science. Knowing the way to the moon is the first part. Already established body of facts by others. That is not interesting. How do I participate? How do I produce knowledge? That is important. How do I estimate the way to the moon sitting on earth? That is the kind of question one must ask. That is why the process of science is as important or more important than the product. Pay attention to the process. Science is often wrongly portrayed as an elitist activity accessible only to those endowed with grants of social. You can see we are we are, our mind has been set to this. Most of the questions I get is, if I use this expensive experiment, can I find out? Can I find out what is the genetic basis of this? We are, move, we move instinctively almost towards very sophisticated things where the answers are important. We must learn to move to simple things where I can find the answer without anything else. Good science can be practiced by anyone with a sharp mind, even without any grants and laboratories. Science should become a democratic grassroots activity accessible to all, young and old, rich and poor. No high school students should be able to say, oh, I can't do science. I, while I apply to the Department of Biotechnology, they won't give me a grant. You don't need grants. Science is a process. Science is a way of life. Science is a way of thinking. And that is what we must cultivate. That is what we are very interested in. This is my sli last slide. Thank you. Any, any further questions, if there is time? I will be happy to answer. Sure. Thank you. Sir. Are there any questions? Um, uh, Vidya, may, may I ask a question? Please. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Professor Gadakar, first of all, thank you for a very, a, a very interesting two hours. Okay, hey, I, I just didn't uh, feel like. Okay, so thank you so much once again. Sure. Uh, I had one uh, small question uh, regarding that standard or calibration curve uh -huh. uh, between the waggle dance and distance. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the thing is that, you know, uh, even though the bees may not be kind of actively doing it, uh, mm. having mm. something similar, would they would have learned or, or known to actually you know, communicate between the scouts and the others. Uh? And that that one da, one calibration actually you know uh, embodies the the visual complexity. Everything yes. is embedded there in that one curve. Yes. Yes. So uh, my question is maybe I'll put it this way that you know uh, uh, be with a with a kind of foraging area which is heavily wooded, mm. released in a foraging area which is kind of you know sparse. Yes. Or kind of open. Yes. Okay. Would they uh, be co confused? Would they be able to relearn? What do you, uh, or maybe there are some experiments already done. 
brilliant, brilliant. This is the way direction in which you should think. There's a very simple, mischievous answer to this question. The problem is that the bee, the scout bee, and the bee which has to find the food have to fly in the same forest. So it's a matter of convention. See, I let's say I I'm confused. This is suddenly I've been brought to a very wooded forest. I make an error. But the trouble is the watchers, so we speak the same language, you see. That's the point. You both of them make the same error. If you train a bee, if you send a scout in a wooded forest, make it dance and send the watcher in a sparse forest, then only there's a problem. But no, so if if we all today decide that this is my left hand, and if we all agree, then there is no confusion. Everybody knows this is my left hand. So it's it's a matter of convention. Because both the speaker and the listener speak the same language, make the same mistakes, have the same error, there is no problem. But you can show that there will be a problem by doing this, by doing such an experiment. You can actually show. But the bees don't have the problem because of this convention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Are there Professor, any the, other may, questions? Professor Vida, may I ask one question? Yes, please. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for this uh, such a beautiful talk. So, uh, so as you said, in bees there are some scout bees. Yes. So, scout bees have some some special quality because they are searching food, all these things, and other are following them. Then they are part. Not really. See, what the bees do is rough. The bees have a very nice organized division of labor. It's all age dependent. The youngest bees they are not able to do very much. So, what they do is they start by cleaning the. They are cleaner bees. Yes. After some time, their glands to produce wax will develop. And once they do that, they make wax, they become builder bees. After that, okay. other glands in their mouths will develop where they can produce chemicals meant for nourishment. Then they will become nurse bees. And then slowly yes. they'll move outside. So second half of their life, only they venture outside. But once they start venturing outside, who is a scout, who is a follower is not based on age. Suppose I am hungry. And I find there are hungry larvae, food is needed, nobody is dancing. So let me become a scout. Or if so many scouts are dancing, they've already done the work, they're telling me, why should I be a scout? I'll follow them. So whether you're a scout or a follower depends on what is happening in your environment. It is so not that means a specialization. This is not an instinctive property, rather by practice they are developing. It is based on circumstance, based on opportunity. If nobody is dancing, everybody is hungry, somebody has to be a scout, so I'll be a scout. Yes. If 20 bees are dancing, they've already found, why should I be a scout? I'll go and get food from there. So it's based on opportunity. Yes. So if you allow me, so another question is probably not very much related to the experiment you have discussed. Hmm. But you see, in, in evolution theory, every every animal has some reproductive power and that is the fundamental for their existence. But in case of B, yes. most of them have, doesn't have any reproductive power, but, but in evolution theory, they, they are not extinct. They yes. still survive. Excellent. So on the face of it, Darwinian theory is either disproved by bees or bees... Or, or it, in some sense, right? it is challenged. Yes, it's a major... And Darwin was not unaware of it. In fact, Darwin wrote in his book that the honeybee workers at one time I thought was the most di great difficulty for my theory. In fact, he thought it was insuperable for my theory. So he worried very much about this. Today, we have a somewhat sophisticated understanding because we realize that to really understand evolution, we must look at it from the point of view of the genes, not of the individual. And what the honeybees are doing is they're working for their close relatives who also share the genes. So passing on your genes one way is through offspring, but it can also be passed on through close relatives who have similar genes. Now, the power of this theory is that you can actually make it quantitative because I know that there is a certain probability my genes are in my offspring, but there's a different probability that they are in my nephews. So mm -hmm. then you must make prediction of how much I work, should I work for my offspring and how much should my nephew, and you can test and this prediction can be proved. So yes. the amount of altruistic work you do without producing your own children is proportional to the probability that you will transmit your genes to future generations to that offspring. So, for example, offspring should be favored over uh, nephews, nephews should be favored over cousins, cousins should be favored over strangers, and all this can be shown. So, given that the Darwinian fitness, the new version of Darwinian fitness, which is called inclusive fitness, is a sum, is an arithmetic sum of offspring production and relative production. And you add these two. So, because it is additive, one can be zero. So, an individual can be sterile but have lots of fitness. 
and that is nice thing is this is additive the inclusive fitness is the arithmetic sum of the direct fitness got through offspring production and indirect fitness got through relatives but the nice thing is that one anyone can be zero i can be entirely self fit make my own offspring never help my brother sisters nephews cousins i can still have a lot of fitness or i can be totally altruistic have no children of my own spend all my time for helping my cousins i can still have a lot of fitness that's the beauty of the modern theory which is called kin selection it's called hamilton's rule a man called hamilton came up with this rule where he came up with this it's also called inclusive fitness theory so now darwinian fitness is the new, new concept is inclusive fitness direct plus indirect thank you thank you uh, there's a question from raghavan is there a concept of assignment of duties uh, along the lines of your response instinctively working as a scout by someone of higher hierarchy that is the beauty of social insects it's almost entirely bottom up there is no top down control the only time when individuals interfere with each other and punish them is when they are trying to reproduce out of turn because as just now was mentioned reproduction is a very important thing so if a worker who is not supposed to reproduce starts reproducing she will be beaten up but other than that it is entirely bottom up it is all self organized there is no leader there is no hierarchy the queen is only queen because she reproduces she doesn't tell the workers what to do almost everything is bottom up self organized decentralized self regulated these are the metaphoric terms that we use to describe how insect societies work it is not bottom up top down instructed by a leader almost never but you can learn you can teach they can they teach they learn but they do not the police except in the context of reproduction uh there's a question from soham if the queen dies can one of the workers become the queen if so what decides which bee becomes the next queen so it, again see in biology the devil is in the details so it depends on which species if you're talking honey bees workers can never become queens because workers are born differently queens are born differently if a honey bee queen dies workers can never become queens and they will not accept foreign queens so they have only two options they have to rear a new queen from scratch that means they have to find a very young larva give her the special kind of food which is needed to make a queen if they have a young larva they will do that and that process is called emergency queen rearing they will find a young larva feed her the special kind of food which is of course called queen royal jelly and she will they'll make a new queen but they will not accept foreign queens but if they don't have young larva end of story the colony will die because they don't accept foreign queens they can't become queens but if you look at the wasp that i study queens and workers are identical somebody becomes queen today she is overthrown another worker becomes queen tomorrow and in fact we have spent years and years trying to answer your question how is it decided i am happy to tell you that after 20 years of work we don't know you can remove the queen after remove the queen i will in 30 minutes i will tell you with 100% accuracy who is next queen before removing the queen i cannot tell we have worked for years and years trying to answer this question i am happy to say that we don't know my wasps are smarter than me we have also shown uh, that they know geeta has we have also shown that they know who the next queen is going to be we are clever enough to find out that they know we don't know in fact we published a paper saying we know that they know yes somebody else had a question yeah uh is the self organization genetically programmed as in is it the environment that determines who becomes a queen or the genes in the case of honey bees this is uh, very well known it is entirely the environment that is genetics determines whether a bee will become a male or a female but once it is a female genotype everything depends on the food she gets early in life so you give me a female destined egg i will give you back a worker or larva as you desire is entirely environment but in some species there is some genetic determination but in most species it is entirely dependent on the environment uh, are there any other questions i think no uh if there are no more questions thank you so much sir for a wonderful talk as usual I and it's especially nice to much. have you here at the 25 years celebration of resonance given the role you played in 
<laughs> setting up resonance. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Do you, is somebody going to say when the next session begins?